the kids who told on us got preferential treatment, whereas the children who sang their songs and spoke their language were punished constantly for every, any little thing, for even, even for laughing. It was always hard for us to tell one another we love you because we were taught to love was wrong. They told us to love was wrong, that was the devil's work. But yet these priests and nuns could hug and kiss and we couldn't even hug our own brothers. We couldn't even hold them and tell them we loved them. It took me a lot of years before I was able to tell my boys I loved them. Three years it took me to realize it, though, you know, of torture and pain, you know, being strapped at a young. You know, I, I lost my childhood when I first got there and never knew what it was like to have parents. Still hurts. Sorry about that. Sorry, you don't apologize. But I never knew my mother, and still don't today. I couldn't remember any good times that were there uh -huh. because I was being um, punished for things I'd never done. Like what kind of punishment? Uh, punishment by restraining me to the bed, by putting a restrainer on me and holding me down in the bed. Um, I had bed problems as wetting the bed and they would tie me in bed and put an electric underneath my sheet so that when I did wet, I would electrocute myself. Did they put you in a hospital? Yes, I did. Well, they uh, give me some drugs or something like that. What kind, what happened I to you? I don't know what kind of drug it was. What happened to you when they gave you the drugs? Hey, oh, they uh, put me in there like a padded room. Padded room, like, I was uh, strapped down. That was after you reported the girl? Yeah. Finding the girl's body? Yeah. I'd seen them burn hands of kids when they're three years old and five with a little spike in their hand and like that, like a shock thing. Electric shock yeah. device? Why did they shock the kids? Because the kids wouldn't listen to the Catholic priests. He used it on my brother's penis. He electrocuted his penis there till my brother passed out. And he was laughing, brother. My brother said he was laughing while he was doing it. You'd like to see him in pain, I guess. And then the police force, I, I was involved in a few investigations regarding the victims of a residential school where one particular individual had went home in the summer and learned how to speak his own language. And his dad had taught him how to carve. <clears throat> and he went back to school. He, uh, he, uh, he continued doing this, speaking his own language and carving. And the teacher caught him and took his knife away and broke his carving up. And, and he took a pencil and he drove it right through his hand. And you still see the scar where he drove the pencil right through his, his hand. Then there was other times where they put us in a tub and then they had a bucket of snakes, you know, them black and yellow snakes. And they'd throw that in the tub while we're having a bath. And the snakes are, they can't stand that hot water. They're trying to crawl all over our bodies, trying to get away from that hot water. And they'd all just curl up because they die immediately. And those are some of the horrifying things that they'd done to us, to discipline us, to keep quiet. What had I got myself into? My whole world was being turned upside down. I had a young family to support. My children were still only infants. I couldn't put them at risk, which I would be if I let those stories be spoken from my pulpit. I didn't know what to believe or who to believe. I know I didn't want to believe these stories. Well, when you went home at night with your family, your wife and two daughters, did you talk about this? Did they talk? Was this supper material to talk about? No, I couldn't really share this around my kids or really my wife at the time. Um, 
you know, it, for one thing, it was told in confidence, and another thing was uh, it was a nightmare. I needed help. I turned to the people who I thought would understand and support me, my colleagues in the church. That was a mistake. From top to bottom, the church denied that any children had been harmed in the residential schools. Not only that, but church officials even threatened me to keep quiet about what I had been told. I was told to just stick to what they called being a good minister and tend to my flock. But that's what I thought I was doing by opening the doors of my church, even to Indians. And that's ultimately what the church found intolerable, that I was bringing that truth, you know, into the pews on Sunday and, and letting those people who had been silenced for so long, long speak. And I'm still trying to do that in the work I do. Well, didn't any of the church ministers sit down and sit with you and say, these are the rules and regulations, you're not to mess with the natives and this is what happens? They weren't that blatant, but it was a subtle, they were subtle warnings I got. Uh, there was a fellow, uh, Bill Howie, who was head of the, the church, he was kind of like the regional rep for the United Church on Vancouver Island, and he came over to me after my first Presbytery meeting, which is where all the ministers get together a few times every year. And, and I made a comment at that meeting about how it was odd to me that there were no native people in our churches and that and we should begin to look into the reason why. And Bill Howie came over and he sat down next to me and he, with his big flashy smile, he said, you know, you have a very promising career in the United Church and a young family to support. And if I were you, I'd be careful about comments and, t and looking too much into, into the native people. So did it's you, like- Did you get it? No, I mean, to, to me, that seemed very odd he would say that. And I didn't think, you know, I was filled with illusions and I thought, well, this is the Church of Christ. I mean, we're not going to stab each other in the back. I mean, I was very ignorant of our own history. There's an establishment within the United Church in Port Alberni that um, set out to destroy Kevin Annett, and they, they set out by contacting those members, which I call the cliques in, in Port Alberni, um, bring them together and uh, discredit Kevin Annett at all costs. Because what they had to lose was the fear of, of, of course, financial retribution from the Aboriginal people, but also they didn't want to hear about uh, murders and they didn't want to hear about abuses that took place with the Aboriginal people because they felt that they'd have too much to lose. And let's face it, they would. Who would want to go to a church that, that abused Aboriginal kids, murdered Aboriginal kids? When these stories began to be told, you could see some of the older white people visibly wincing and getting very uptight. And I didn't know at the time what it was about. It, didn't, it wasn't until subsequently that I learned that there was literal skeletons in the closet. Of, of, the, of the United Church, and they certainly didn't want them to come out. Yeah, I remember uh, back in 1992 when Kevin first invited us, I got the impression from non-Aboriginal people that, uh, that attended the service that uh, this was all fine and dandy, but uh, this really made a lot of them feel uncomfortable, and I got that impression by talking to a lot of them. And um, in fact, one of the comments made by one of the churchgoers was that they couldn't understand why Kevin was reaching out to us, the Aboriginal people of the Alberni Valley. I understood why Kevin was doing it because there had been an alienation for a number of years, and uh, but I didn't know that the the anti-Aboriginal congregation that existed there was so adamant that they didn't want anything to do with us. What kind of people didn't they like? Well, definitely not the poor. <laughs> you know that one was obvious right off. The... Well, there is a lot of yeah. racial discrimination. Yeah, a lot of a lot of racial stuff. They didn't want natives in the church. And as Kevin developed uh, the food bank and developed um, a dialogue about the murders that took place in residential schools, I suddenly saw firsthand um, the attacks that started to come towards Kevin. It first started out as whispers, and I remember hearing from people in the Alberni Valley who, who used to go to the coffee shops that uh, Kevin Annett was opening up a can of worms he shouldn't be opening up, and how dare he? Which is why I was removed so quickly. I was just summarily fired from my, my job without any cause without any due process or anything. On January 23, 1995, after nearly three years as minister of St. Andrew's United Church, Kevin Annett was fired without cause or notice by two officials of the United Church, without the knowledge or consent of his congregation. Kevin was told by one of these officials, Art Anderson, that there were no charges against him and that he was not under discipline, but that nevertheless he had to submit to what Anderson called, quote, pastoral retraining, and psychiatric evaluation if he was to remain a United Church minister. Anderson provided no evidence to support these requirements. At the time of Kevin's firing, his church was filled to capacity on Sunday mornings, and Kevin had just received a vote of approval for his work and ministry by 90% of his congregation.